and this evening the discussion is going to be on calligraphy as asian art and buddhist practice and the discussion was presented a while ago i think maybe three or four years ago does anybody remember seeing it one person good yeah maybe two people vaguely um the topic is an important aspect of east asian buddhism and it may be new to some people and a useful review for others additionally we're considering a public exhibit later uh, either this summer or next fall so i thought that this would be a good time to sort of go over what is calligraphy and why is it important here we go okay as an introduction as you know, the earliest Buddhist teachings were based on an Indian oral tradition and Shakyamuni Buddha's discourses were memorized by his disciples and their disciples for generations. And then finally, these teachings were written down starting in the third century BCE in Sanskrit and later in Pali. Further, the earliest teachings were more, were mere philosophic and practical or more philosophical and practical and architecture and sculpture representations of teachings really didn't take place until a little bit later. The artistry of sacred texts, while not unknown in India, flourished in East Asia. Calligraphy has long been valued in East Asia and in Europe, and only, only to convey information, but also as an art form, as a means of enhancing sacred works, calligraphic art takes on new meaning. We see, that in, we see that in the illuminated text of the Torah, the Christian Bible, the Quran of West Asia and Europe, as well as the magnificent calligraphic renderings of Buddhist canon in Korea, China, and Japan. So as an inter introduction, I'd like to point out one distinct difference in the East Asian and Afro-European systems, and that is cuneiform. At the origin of the European, as the origin of the European system started out as pictographic images at around 3500 BCE in Sumeria. And syllabat, syllabat, syllabic and alphabetic systems developed not long after on the Indian subcontinent in Egypt. So we find Sanskrit and we find hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics in uh, Egypt. An advantage of an alphabet is that you have literally hundreds of thousands of combinations of letters to create words and the alphabet can adapt rapidly to the new meanings the art of alphabetic characters in both style and illustration around it can be quite beautiful and in east asia that is to say china characters have a similar beginning to cuneiform but a different development development and a different artistic presentation which then becomes integrated into Buddhist philosophy and practices. And we can see that the beginning of this were so-called oracle bones. Oracle bones, also known as dragon's bones, were the shoulder blades of oxen and the plasterings of turtle, the flat undersides of the turtle shell, which were used in the Shang dynasty of China. 1600 to 1046 BCE for divination. The symbols carved in the bones eventually became words. Recognizable Chinese characters developed from this. Many of the dragon bones, by the way, we have a couple of acupuncturists, well, one acupuncturist here. Um, dragon bones were and are used in Chinese medicine uh, for therapeutic purposes. They're crushed into powders and ingested. Oh, usually, they're very helpful, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, Chinese characters are logograms, written characters that represent a word or morphine, but several different types can be identified based on the manner in which they are formed or derived. There are a handful which are derived from pictographs and a number that are ideographs, representing ideas as symbols independently of sounds. And an example would be, here we go, if you can see that, um, you can see on the left-hand side of the top left, you see a mountain, and then you see the symbol 
that was derived from that mountain, which later became the logogram, the character, and then you see the character that's used today. So that first symbol is Yama for mountain. Going down, the second symbol is Kawa for river. The third going down is root, hon, and the fourth one that's coming down is ni for sun. So you can see how the pictograph became a logogram, and then it became the character. And so that's not to say that when a Chinese or a Japanese person looks at a Yama, in some ways the character will give them the idea of a mountain, and more about that in just a second. And so as an example, the name of Japan in Japanese is Nihon, a combination of the third and fourth characters. Ni, the sun, and Hon, the root, which in Japanese it would be uh, the uh, sun's origin. That comes from the Chinese originally. That is a fascinating story in and of itself, in and, of itself and I won't go into that now, but just to give you an idea of how that works. So many of the uh, Chinese and Japanese kanji are made of multiple symbols uh, like you would see there, Nihon in, in this case, the two, the two characters meaning Sun and Hon, which is, Hon means both root, but it also means origin, uh, that sort of thing, like the root of something. Um, the point is, an alphabet is a standardized set of written letters that represent particular spoken sounds in a language. And alphabetic characters are abstract. They require some mental gymnastics which piece together a combination of letters that form an idea. Chinese characters, there we go, Chinese character uh, or Japanese kanji form an image in the mind that is transformed into an idea or description. And, it, and it's, it's, it's so what I'm trying to convey is what neurobiologists talk about, and that is, oops, oh shoot, there we go, there we go. Neurobiologists who study the differences between an alphabet and all, all logograms inform us that this makes a significant difference in how we understand and process information and ideas. When you're looking at a sentence made up of words in English, your mind is visualizing the individual word, and the word is water, and you conceptualize water. If you're looking at, um, or river, let's say, if you're looking at the, the symbol for river that you just saw a few moments ago, you're not only recognizing that that symbol with the three squiggly lines on there is a river, but it also has a mental impression of a river. And I'm, I'm doing all this to, be, to better understand why, why uh, East Asian calligraphy forms the way it does. This is not just, you know, little known facts about little known facts. Um, so, thus in East Asian calligraphy, the written character has significance. In ideas, conveyed visually by the symbolism in the arrangement of the characters in the strength or depth of the brush stroke and the explicit denotative or connotative meaning. Not to say that, that um, European calligraphy, especially in illustrated or illuminated texts like the, the, the Bible or something along those lines, is very beautiful, but it really has a different neurologic <clears throat> basis into how we understand the information. But as art, these can be very simple, such as the one which is in this particular uh, picture, which can be appreciated for the stroke as well as the overall composition. Now recognize that this composition of this particular character is as much the artistic composition as what it's going to say. In this case, the form of composition is as 
or more important than what the composition actually says. So it's important to keep this in mind. Why does this work sometimes and not other times? There we go. So even if you read kanji or Chinese characters, you would not necessarily be able to read a particular scroll. The two scrolls that you'll see that are on the, the front wall of the Hondo, if you ask uh, Schumann what they mean, she'll say, I don't know. Because the form, and this will make more sense in a minute, the form is as important as what is being said, the content. We're accustomed to looking at words, and we know what the word means, or we go and look it up in a dictionary if we don't. But in a calligraphy, you don't necessarily understand what the word means, or you can get part of it, but not all of it. So the image itself, with a, you can study the image itself with a sort of intuitive understanding that conveys a meaning, even if you don't understand literally what it says. Does one really need to know what it says to appreciate the form? It's usually the case when you're looking at calligraphy that there'll be a, that someone can say to you because they've been told by the calligrapher, well, this is what it means. And so you have that, or if you're looking in a, art gallery, it'll have a little plaque that says, this is the translation of this. So it's usually the case that you'll have, a, that the calligraphy is coming from a quote, a verse, a phrase, and this becomes a kind of contemplation, which one uses while viewing the scroll. So if you, if you look at the plaque, if it's in a gallery, then you can say, okay, this is what it says. Now look at the look at it, you may or may not know what it says, but the visual form will have something to say to you. Now I'm going to go a little bit in, a little bit deeper into why some of this is even more confusing. Here's an example of a particular term, a particular kanji, and reading from the right to left, and, and typically in Japanese you'd read from right to left, well actually read from top to bottom, right to left. So you'd read from the right upper corner down, then the next left down, etc. Because it's normally going top to bottom. And so in the case of the kanji um, that are written here, um, are different ways of classifying script. And there's there's more than just these these five, but these are are an examples. In this slide, starting on the right, is the seal script, Tensho. And so the bottom character in all of these is Sho. So if you just look at that bottom character in each of them, each of these, each of those means Sho. The top character is going to mean seal or clerical or standard, etc. In the case of the far right hand seal, it's the seal means like a hanko, it's a stamp. And so that's a form. And typically you'll see um, a description of a temple using that's the earliest form of kanji and the earliest form of Chinese characters also. Um, and so they say show in all these cases is exactly the same. But the 10, I'm not really sure what, what the 10 is for. Perhaps a Jishima sensei could tell us later. But you'll notice, you'll see a temple's seal on a, on a scroll or on an official document is often using the one that's on the right. They're still using that pictograph form. Okay. The second one over is the clerical script, the reishi, or excuse me, ratio. And interestingly, the top character, Ray, is translated to follow or to comply. Often, you would look, a person, a Japanese person, look at it, and it might be slave. Don't ask me why. This becomes less ideographic and more logographic. So the seal script is ideographic. It's an idea, whereas the next one over, the clerical, now becomes logographic. It's once removed from the ideogram to a more... Uh, not abstract, but to a more standardized sort of form. And um, 
And as the name implies, that script was originally used in China by clerics, whether they be Taoist or Buddhist or Confucianist, Japan, Shinto. Then the second one is the standard script, Keisho, and as the name implies, is a standard style. And this is what you're going to see in a newspaper or a book, something along that, those lines. And that's what the children are going to learn to write. Marshall, is that yes? Is the bottom row all the same? That's all the same characters show. Okay, just in a different kind of script. Right, just in a different script. And the same for the top. And no, this, the top will be all the the uh, the trans. It'll be seal or clerical or okay. standard, etc. So the the top one will be different, but the bottom one will all be the same. But you can see, looking at the bottom one, how different they can be depending upon the style of script that's being used. Um, whereas the top, you know, that that's that's more descriptive of of what the type of script is. And then the running script, uh, Gyosho, literally is running script, and it's equivalent to the cursive writing. So the the st the standard script would be equivalent to printing. Whereas the next one over the writing script would be equivalent to our cursive writing, something along those lines. And then uh, Sosho, literally grass script, is much more evocative and graceful in writing, but you can see how it doesn't really bear a lot of similarity to, let's say, the clerical skip script. And so when you're looking at, and then you, it can when you're looking at a particular calligraphy, it can even be much more abstract than the grass script. But only the most accomplished uh, calligraphers will, will go something beyond the grass. The grass script, a lot of folks will, will use, but the more abstract is, is a little bit less, less common. Can so I just you, ask one question? Yep. Can most people in Japan read all of those? Uh, they can read the first three for sure. The running script, probably. The grass script, probably not. <laughs> Tamami, are you there? I'm here. What would you I say? I would say that the standard one, that the Kaisho is definitely Gyosho, or um, depends upon the clerical, but the very first one, the Tensho, is very difficult. Some of them you can guess. And grass script, um, all the generations have a better understanding. It's very hard to, and something is so abstract, it's so hard to read. So, you can see how the different forms of the same character can appear different based upon the style. You can also see why it may not be possible to understand exactly what is being expressed by the characters depending upon the script that's being used in the calligraphy. And that's really important to know. So, to a very large extent, depending upon the calligraphy, while there may be an intellectual um, understanding of it, there can also be something which goes beyond the intellect to understanding the calligraphy itself. Now I'm going to discuss um, this as a Buddhist practice. This is the method that one uses when one does calligraphy as one's uh, Buddhist practice. And so, Keep in mind that this is a practice, much like meditation or um, chanting or some other some other practice that one may have. And uh, uh, Shumon, yes. that is um, right. That would be the Nichiren um, no. Dhammokyu. Um, so the first step is selection of the phrase or the verse. And this can come from a sutra, an aphorism, a saying, concept. It can be a single word, something meaningful, often trying to convey what the calligrapher feels, rather than intellectualizes. The next is a consideration as to how it's going to be expressed visually. This is where placement of the content is visualized. Is it going to be more readable or more form, more connotative or more denotative? Then as the practice, it's going to, um, the person's going to use scrap paper, practicing the script I say, the person's going to use scrap paper, newspaper, and you're going to practice, and you're going to experiment. You're going to, to say, here's the space that I've got. If you look 
if you look at the one that's in the corner, which is on a fan, how are the characters going to be placed on that fan? You've got to think about the placement, which is very important, and then consider the saying, the meaning, and then you're going to practice that. And typically, especially if you're going to do something which is less than the standard script, you're going to practice it over and over again until you get it right. I think of this more as the playing of music. You have to rehearse the piece until it becomes, you know it so well that you can play it almost without looking at the notation. It's a similar sort of idea for calligraphy. And then, in some ways, you're committing the characters to your muscle memory, is another way of looking at it. And then, you're going to contemplate the verse. What is the content and form? It becomes a beginning of the meditation, getting an understanding of the content beyond the intellect. So you know what it is that you want to do. Now you're trying to gain insight into the meaning. Following this, you're going to focus the mind, devoid of mundane thoughts. One has the composition firmly in place in mind. The contemplation has brought one beyond the intellect. Now you're going to empty the mind of everything. And in fact, you're going to be going into a samadhi-like state. Then you want to breathe in harmony with actions, breathing in and out from a coarse breath to a subtle breath. One's kokoro, one's heart, mind, spirit, is in harmony with the surroundings. They're in harmony with the brush, the sumi, which is the ink, the kozo, or the gumpi, which is the paper, typically a mulberry type paper. And then you're going to ex execute the characters in a single fluid moment, an embodiment of the content. The posture must be correct. Posture is included. You notice how this almost sounds like my instruction for meditation. First you have posture, then you have breath, and then you have mind. It's the same process doing calligraphy. So the posture has to be correct, the spine is straight, using the whole arm, you're using the arm, not the wrist. You know, when we write, we're doing this with our wrist. When you're doing, when you're holding a, a, a sumi brush, the whole arm is being used and the wrist is being held solid. It's not, the wrist itself isn't being moved, the, whole, the arm is being moved. So posture is very important. And typically, one executes as the breath is being expelled. Equally, each character uses one breath, though some pieces may require more sophisticated breath, but the motion should be fluid without stopping and thinking. Taken all together, it's a form of meditation. And so what I'd like to do now is give you some examples well, but before we do, before we do that, um, in 2007, the Tendai Calligraphy Association first presented 38 calligraphy scrolls created by its members, including several former and current Zasu, head priests of Monzeki temples and other Soryo, as well as some lay people. And we held an exhibition of these from June 1st to August 31st of 2007 in our hondo. We also conducted a hands-on one-day workshop led by the chair of the association, Hayashida Gyokan, on creating calligraphy. At a later date, we received an addition of 12 pieces of calligraphy from the association, in addition to exhibiting the whole collection several times at Jun's on Tendaiji. And you can see in the picture there the, the, how we presented those materials. As a matter of fact, I see Mushin standing there talking to the current president of Simon's Rock, uh, John Weinstein, and myself. Uh, a curated collection of some of these works have been exhibited at the University of California at Berkeley, the University of Albany, Simon Rock, College of St. Rose, and some other places. And we planned on other presentations, 
but this was thwarted by COVID. We were planning this like in 2019 or 2020, 2020, I think it was. And we were planning on an exhibition perhaps in the, in the autumn, but that didn't happen because of, you know what? So, um, I'm showing you this, as I said before, because we'd like to do another exhibit. And I wanted to inform people a little bit about the calligraphy before we started, because I want you to be excited about it so that you're going to jump in and give a hand. Mm -hmm. Let me show you some of the examples. I'll just, I'm just taking four that are here. And the first one is His Holiness, the most venerable Honda Kojum, who is deceased. He was the 256th Zasu, which is the head of Tendai Buddhism in Japan. And the this says, it says that one must be possessed with chi, wisdom, and gyo practices in order to reach the, reach the state of awakening. In Tendai Buddhism, it is said that one can achieve nirvana when both rational study and actual practices are performed. Here, me is a metaphor for teaching, and asi is a metaphor for leg or practice. And you get an idea of that one. The following one is by Kabori Sensei the most venerable Kabori Kosen, who was the abbot of Sanzen in Monzeki, and Monzeki Temple is a, an imperial temple. Uh, he, and Kabori's, that uh, Kabori Kosen is now deceased. His son is now the head of that temple. Take, take in, and this says, take in the negative to oneself and give to others the positive. Forget oneself and do things for others. It is the greatest good one can do. It is extreme, it is supreme compassion. Let me read that again. Take in the negative to oneself and give to others the positive. Forget oneself and do things for others. It is the greatest good one can do. It is supreme compassion. The third one I'll show you is from Sugawara Sensei and Sugawara Shinke, also now deceased, was the abbot of Nyahoin Monzeki Temple, another imperial temple. G, Maitri, is to love and give happiness, and he, Karuna, is to be sympathetic towards sentient beings and liberate them from suffering. Hence, Jihi means compassion. Point out who said it. And the following is so you see slight differences in the styles of the calligraphy in each of these, and each I would say that each of these are really beautiful examples of, of calligraphy. They both have a, a wonderful calligraphic style. The Zasu, as well as Kabori Sensei and um, Sagawa Sensei. And then this one is by Miss Osawa Kazuo Yn, and, and many times in, in Japan, when the person has mastered their craft, whether it's a tea ceremony or calligraphy uh, or becoming a Buddhist priest, you get a name within that lineage. And so she has a lineage name of Yn. And she's a member of the Tendai Calligraphy Association. <clears throat> and this says, wishing that the light of Buddha Dharma continues to illuminate until the age of purity when Maitreya Bodhisattva is expected to return. And she goes, and in this, Dengyo Daishi, Saicho went to Mount, this, this isn't what it says, but Dengyo Daishi, uh, Saicho went to Mount Tie to start the secluded mountain training in Rakoji and he hard carved the image of Yakshin Yorai, the medicine Buddha, or the Buddha of healing. He lit the lamp in front of it and read this poem. He lit the lamp with the hope that the teaching of Tendai Buddhism will illuminate the world into the far future and be transmitted. The light that Dengyo Daishi lit 
has been kept with great care as the eternal lamp of the Dharma, and has burned since that time at Kompon Chudo, the main temple of Tendai Buddhism in Mount Hiei over 1,200 years ago. So that was her description of why she wrote that particular, that particular um, calligraphy. Okay. What do you think of it? Can you see the... Yeah, can you read the translation of the last one again, please? Sure. Wishing that the light of the Buddha Dharma continues to illuminate until the age of purity when Maitreya Bodhisattva is expected to return. That's the translation. Um, Shumon, would you be able to read the one on the right? On the right? Uh, yeah. The right? Yes. Some of the characters are going to be Okay. And the one that's just to the left of that, you can read that fairly well. Yes. As well as the other two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it gives you an idea of what can and can't be read. <clears throat> Now, I don't know that this brief presentation provides the kind of depth calligraphy is due, both as an art as well as a Buddhist practice. It's a taste. Um, once I began to think about the topic seriously, I realized that I could only scratch the surface. I intended to include Siddham, Sanskrit characters, more about the role of calligraphy in Buddhist development in China and Japan, and a number of other topics that are integral to Asian calligraphy and to Asian Buddhism. As a matter of fact, some of the sources listed in the following slide were not used in the presentation, but will be seen in future presentations on the subject. If people are interested, I'm not going to do it if people don't find an interest in it, but if you're interested, I'd like to, I'd like to do a few more of uh, maybe the Sedim, certainly. As I mentioned in the presentation, it's our intention to hold a calligraphy exhibit uh, several years ago at the temple and perhaps one of the local colleges. And so one day soon, I'd like to do an exhibit and then have a one day retreat workshop to let people practice the calligraphy um, with the materials and actually experience what it's like to incorporate calligraphy into a Buddhist practice. So you have to let me know if you're interested, but please accept this taste of calligraphy. See if you have an appetite for it. And these are the sources that I used. Isn't he a cute little guy? <laughs> a South American monkey. So, what questions, thoughts do we have? Uh, let me, first of all, We'll unmute everyone, and I'll ask Ichishima Sensei if you'd like to add anything to the presentation. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. And these calligraphies uh, done by various Buddhist priests, is well-known priests. Some of them passed away. The last uh, calligraphy written by Osawa uh, Tomoto. Uh, she is she, her writing is uh, this is a symbol of the Daniel Dai Saicho and also the song of Tendai Shu uh, still today. So Saicho Daniel Dai Shi a little light eternal light uh, so that uh, his wishes of Dharma spread and uh, up <clears throat> up to the Maitreya future Buddha will come down to this world. I think this is a very amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Thank you. I appreciate that. What questions or comments do we have? 